Museum. And it's a real thrill for me to be able to introduce our very special lecturer um, and also our guest curator for the exhibition that we have right now upstairs. Um, I hope all of you have had a chance to see it and I hope you'll return many times armed with the insights that I'm sure Peyton will share with you in his, his lecture. There is really no one better qualified to curate this exhibition nor anyone better qualified to speak to the art of this very special chapter in the history of modernism. It's one that isn't quite as familiar as perhaps continental modernism, French, for example, Impressionism, post-Impressionism. We're all so sick of that story, aren't we? We're ready to finally return to the fold of the great British modernists, and all of them are well represented, well, nearly all, in this very fine selection made by Hayden. And I'm very, very proud to say that the whole of the exhibition comes from our permanent collection. And that is something that very few museums could boast. Of. We are one of two, apparently, according to Peyton, who have the ability to narrate this chapter in the history of art uh, with such depth and coverage. And that is largely due to two incredible uh, and wonderful donors to our museum over many years. One is uh, Roy Luddington, who is no longer with us, although he is continually with us um, in our permanent collection, to which he contributed on many levels. And uh, the other are a couple, uh, Will and Mary Richardson. And I'm so thrilled to say that uh, my very dear friend, Mary Richardson, is in the audience with us this evening. So she's able to revisit with so many of the wonderful works of art that she and she's also brought her family with her, so this is something of a reunion uh, with Peyton Skipwith, who is not, not only a very well-regarded specialist of this entire chapter of uh, English art, but also a great friend of that family. Um, so just to mention a few of his rather amazing accomplishments, um, he was Deputy Managing Director of the Fine Arts Society and was there for 44 years. Uh, and he organized a slew of exhibitions on uh, fine and decorative arts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, he was just telling me now that he is the manager of the uh, essay of the artist Edward Bodden, um, which is something that he continues to occupy himself with, as well as um, continuing to publish extensively. So we have several of his books in the store uh, for sale, so maybe you could even impose upon him to sign a copy for you. Um, but he's written copiously and has published in many fine uh, journals, including Apollo, Country Life, World of Interiors, and the Literary Review. So please join me in welcoming Peyton Skipwith, um, who will give a lecture. Um, Thank you, Ike, for that. Um, I will try and live up to it. Um, as you all know, history is really, as far as most of us are concerned, has no beginning and no end. It is a, a continuum. There's a great debate going on in Britain at the moment because the British Museum has an exhibition of arts and artifacts from Southern Africa. And the debate is whether they should call it 100,000 years of art and artifacts or 3 million years of art and artifacts. Um, <laughs> And so the the six and a half decades that separate Whistler's The Falling Rocket, knocked down in black and gold, and the outbreak of the uh, Second War uh, is the merest, smallest, smallest, smallest drop in that Grecian, great ocean of art history. But I've chosen this as a beginning piece because the exhibiting of it uh, was one of those great watershed moments in British art. Uh, Whistler, of course, as you know, was an American, but he spent most of his working life either in France or in Britain. And when this picture was exhibited uh, at the Grosvenor Gallery, for some reason, Ruskin, that great critic, uh, the great exponent of Turner's work, uh, the man who explained the architecture of Venice to the Western world and is still really the greatest historian of Venice, for some reason took wildly against this painting. And Ruskin, complicated man, as many of those great Victorians were, 
published his own magazine. It was called Falls Clavigera, and it was for the working men of Britain. What the working men of Britain made of it, I've never quite discovered. But in it, uh, Ruskin wrote about this picture. But he wrote, I have seen and heard much of cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. <laughs> Whistler, who was a pugnacious little character, uh, I think it was that the Gabriel Rossetti, the great uh, pre-Raphaelite painter who wrote for the little verse about, there was a young artist called Whistler, who was also known as the Bristler. A tube of white lead or a punch on the head come equally handy to Whistler. <laughs> Whistler, sued, Whistler sued Ruskin for loss of sales. And the whole thing went to court. It was taken very seriously. It was actually the Attorney General who was uh, prosecuting, uh, was acting for, the, for, for Ruskin. Um, but Whistler chose to treat the whole uh, court performance as, as, as a farce. And when the um, Attorney General said to him, do you think that you could make me see, see the beauty of that picture? Whistler looked at him very closely and said, no. <laughs> you know, I fear it would be as hopeless as for a musician to pour his notes into the ear of a deaf man. <laughs> <laughs> Whistler won the case, but was awarded one farthing stabbing. <laughs> a farthing was a quarter of an old uh, pound, uh, sorry, a quarter of an old penny, when there were 240 pennies in the pound. So what he basically got was a little uh, more than one, a one thousandth of a pound. Uh, and he had all his legal costs to pay, um, which bankrupted him. Uh, but he, he uh, wrote the whole thing up uh, in a pamphlet called The Gentle Art of Making Enemies. And I've often speculated, and there's no way, I mean, you can't rewrite history or write into history things that didn't happen, but one of Whistler's uh, both neighbours in, in Chelsea and rivals, particularly in wit, was Oscar Wilde. And I've often speculated that if Whistler hadn't actually sued Ruskin, I suspect Wilde may not have sued the Marquis of Queensbury. But whereas Whistler was able to make a great joke uh, about the beauty of the pictures, etc., in Oscar Wilde's case, when he was asked whether he would kiss a boy and said it depended how beautiful he was, uh, the consequences were a great deal more serious. But Whistler was able to get, get away with it. And this it was another of the pictures that was produced in that trial. This is probably... Whistler's most famous image, the portrait of his mother. Whistler, at this stage in the, in the 1880s, had a young studio assistant whose work we'll see a lot of uh, in my talk tonight, uh, which was Walter Richard Sickert. Sickert was actually a, a studio assistant to Whistler uh, when he was a very young man, and Whistler entrusted him with taking this painting from London to Paris, to the, to the Louvre. And it was on that expedition that Whistler gave uh, the young Sickert an introduction to Degas, who became a very great friend. Uh, in the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, there is a marvelous big pastel uh, by Degas of a group of friends in Dieppe, one of whom uh, is, is uh, Sickert. And, of course, Whistler was also famous not only for his nocturnes, but for the, his very striking series of single portraits of very dramatic portraits, both of, of men and women, in this case, of a poor young girl, Cicely Alexander, who, I can't remember, had to, I mean, over a long period, had something like 400 hours of standing uh, for this portrait to be made. But Whistler was one of the most significant figures uh, in British art in that last, uh, the turn of the last, um, Third, last, third of, the, of, of the 19th century. Um, British art before that had been very much oriented towards both Germany and Italy. Uh, there is a strong tradition in English art of the use of narrative. The whole of the pre-Raphaelite movement, of course, comes out of that tradition. But 
Whistler had trained in Paris, and the group of painters who were around him and who were inspired by him looked to Paris rather than to either Rome or uh, Berlin for their inspiration. This is an early painting by, by the uh, young Walter Sickert, uh, done in the, in the late 1880s as a very young man. And Sickert and another artist we'll see in a minute, Philip Wilson Steer, and you'll see work by both of them uh, in, in the galleries upstairs here, uh, actually lived throughout the whole of this period of my talk. They were both born in 1860, they both died in 1942, so they were uh, there at, at, at the inception, and very much um, French-oriented. Sickert was actually a very international figure. Uh, he was born in Schleswig-Holstein, which was set in Denmark, later, later colonized by Germany, uh, largely brought up in France. Um, his, his mother was Irish, his father uh, was, was Danish and, and Germanic. Um, and Sickert spent a lot of his time, early life, in Dieppe, where this uh, little painting is done. And in fact, there's just been a big exhibition of his work in the Castle Museum in Dieppe. And there's a, for the first time, a French person has actually written a biography of him. And in the introduction to it, the great English expert on Sickert, an old friend of William Mary Richardson's, uh, Wendy Barron, um, has wrote something which hadn't occurred to me before. And that is that if Sickert had died in about 1913, 1914, he would actually probably be regarded by historians as a French artist rather than a British artist. But, and this is Wilson Steer, who I say was exactly born the same year, 1860, died 1942. An important thing happened in the mid-1880s, like 1884 to be precise, a new exhibiting society was founded uh, in opposition or in rivalry to, to the Royal Academy. The Royal Academy, uh, which was already a, more than a century old, had dominated uh, the public display of art in Britain for the whole of the previous century. But these young artists, um, we're talking of people who are 20, 25, 28, 30, that sort of price, uh, that sort of age range, uh, were discontented with the power of the academy, and they founded this new exhibiting society, uh, which came to be called the New English Art Club, or commonly known as the NEAC. But one of its proposed titles, when the committee, and all clubs need committees of some sort, uh, were discussing what they should call it, one of its proposed titles had been the Society of Anglo-French Painters. And uh, certainly Wilson Steer was very, very much in the avant-garde of that. Uh, this painting of girls running along the beach at Walmerswick, painted between in, in the very late 1880s. And it's a very revolutionary painting for that sort of date. In fact, Wilson Steer became a much more conservative painter uh, later, later in life. But the New English Art Club was uh, described by one critic for day as that Steary, this is a uh, Steer, Starry, this is a painting by Sidney Starr, uh, Stotty, lot of painters, this is a painting by William Stock, William Stott of Oldham, and uh, this is a painting by a similar named artist, Edward Stott, who came also from Lancashire, but they were no relation. But what they were very much influenced by was uh, the French very low-key paintings, particularly those of Jules Bastien Lafarge, uh, a rather short-lived but very, very, very influential uh, French painter in his day, and a sort of counterbalance to, to the Impressionists. Uh, it's not accidental that, particularly in Britain, uh, where the weather is mixed. I'm sure that many of you have been to England and you've all taken your Macintoshes there. But if you're, going to paint, if you're going to paint out of doors in northern Europe, where the light is continually changing, the moment you get consistent light is on grey days. Um, the days when there are fleeting clouds, fleeting sunshine, the light keeps changing, and it's very difficult for painters to work. And in fact, even with the French Impressionists, if you look at the titles of particularly many of uh, Camille Pissarro's paintings, he uses the word ton gris, grey weather. And 
certainly it accounts for the low keys used by people like um, William Stott here in this great painting, painted a grey uh, in the forest of, of Fontainebleau, and the French kitchen garden by his namesake, uh, Edward Stott. One of the other pillars of the New English Art Club in these early days was George Clausen. And, of course, what one gets, not from Whistler, but from Bastien de Perge, is this enormously strong uh, concentration on peasant life, country life, um, the life of the country girls, um, people working in the fields, etc. Uh, Whistler, of course, would never have been near a field in his life if he could help it. Uh, he was very much uh, a, t a, t a town man. But a lot of the New English painters uh, worked out in the countryside, and often, although this is a very high key painting by George Clausen, um, it is again one of those intimate and beautiful details of, of, of country life. Um, he had recorded many things, um, the building of a hayrick here by him, and so that sort of pastoral theme uh, is very strong in the 1880s, 1890s, into the early part of the, of the last century. But of course, when one is looking at such a basically short period, uh, and after all, 65 years from the falling rocket to the Second War, uh, is considerably shorter than my own lifetime at this point, but there's, there's a lot of overlap of different things happening. And an enormous amount of international uh, ex exchange, um, and particularly uh, actually from Americans in, in Europe. Uh, Whistler, obviously, at the beginning, but equally uh, that other great uh, Anglo-American uh, Anglo painter, John Singer Sargent. And this is one of his, uh, I think, most brilliant uh, portraits. And needless to say, it was Singer, that great wordsmith and uh, contrary character who invented or coined the phrase of the wriggle and chiffon school of portrait paintings. <laughs> and, and nobody wriggled or chiffon better uh, than Sargent. <laughs> there are two teaching institutions that play a very strong role in the 60-year story that I'm covering. The first was the Slade School of Art, which is still very much in existence, part of London University, set up with, with a bequest from uh, Mr. Slade in the 1860s. Uh, its first uh, principal uh, was an English painter uh, who had been in France uh, along with Whistler. Uh, its second head of school was a man called Alphonse Lebreau, uh, who had been trained in the great tradition of Anne. Uh, in, in France, and Le Gros came to England, he was the most beautiful etcher, uh, a good painter, and obviously a brilliant teacher. He apparently, according to one of the accounts, he never learned English, uh, so he always had a, a, an English assistant as a, as a translator. Uh, but late in life, he took out British nationality, and uh, some friends of his said, yeah, qu'est-ce que tu as gagné, mon cher? And Le Gros thought for a moment and said, J'ai gagné la bataille de Waterloo. <laughs> but he taught a whole brilliant generation of painters, and we've got basically two of them on the screen at the moment. The subject is Augustus, the young Augustus Strong, and the artist is William Orton. And there are two later, much later pictures by Orton in the exhibition upstairs, but including a very good um, uh, portrait, uh, late 1920s portrait of Mr. De Forest. But Orton was uh, a part of a very brilliant uh, quartet of, of students at the Slade uh, in the 1890s. Augustus John, his sitter here, uh, sorry, this I gather is rather uh, overblown on the screen, but John was one of the most brilliant uh, draftsmen of his generation, very, very much in a sort of 17th, 18th, 18th century manner. And John's equally brilliant but very low-key sister, Gwen John. And in fact, many people today seem to rate Gwen John uh, as a greater artist than her brother. So
Certainly she was a more consistent uh, artist, but hers on the whole was a, a still small voice, and indeed a, a still small voice of calm. Uh, her brother was a flamboyant, very flamboyant, uh, very extrovert character. This is a portrait of his very, um, wife and various mistresses and multitudes of children, um, pay painted at the, uh, at the Blue Pool in, in, in Dorset. Extraordinary story, I mean, this painting is now in the Tate Gallery in London, but when I first saw it, uh, it was in a private house in, in England, uh, which belonged to somebody who was a great friend of the Gordon family, Hugo Pittman, whose wife, in fact, was a niece of John Singer Sargent's. Um, and Hugo Pittman described to me uh, going to Augustus Strong's house one, one evening, Augustus Strong's house in Chelsea, and John had gone out, uh, his wife Dorelia uh, said that he'd gone to, the, uh, gone to buy some tobacco, so he'd be back in a few minutes. Um, you know, go, go on and enter the studio and wait for him. And Augustus John hadn't gone to buy some tobacco, obviously dropped in at the pub on the way back, and took rather a long time getting home, by which time Hugo Pittman had looked at all the pictures with her leaning against the wall with their faces out, and he'd looked at most of the canvases with their face to the wall, and then he saw a big roll of canvas, and he unrolled it across the floor. I mean, this painting is about 10 feet long. And uh, then he went out and said to, to, to Rilek, you come in and tell me about this painting. And the real said, for God's sake, throw that up before Gus gets back. He will be livid if he sees that out. And at which moment they heard the front door open. <laughs> and luckily there were two doors to the studio, so Pittman told the real to go out of the other door. And he went out and greeted John and said, come here, I just found the greatest picture you've ever painted. Come and tell me about it. Uh, and he couldn't do anything else. It was right across the floor, so he couldn't put it away. And Pittman said that he had never seen anybody so physically angry as Strom was when he saw this painting unrolled. But he managed to calm him down and said, you know, you haven't got room in your studio to finish it. Why don't you get it stretched? We'll take it down to my house in Oddstock. You live not very, you have a house not very far away. You can come over any time and finish it. And John suddenly thought that was a brilliant idea. Calm down totally. And many times he went to the house with the intention of finishing it. But somehow, psychologically, he never touched it again. He always left his brushes behind, left his paints behind, left for some reason always that he, he couldn't carry, carry on with it. And then at the beginning of the war, uh, Hugo Pittman said to him, you know, I'd like to buy that painting. <coughs> None of us know what's going to happen. You know, bomb can fall on the house. I would rather, rather be responsible for the things in my own house rather than have somebody else's property that I'd like to buy it. John said, what do you mean buy it? You found it, didn't you? It's yours. <laughs> and so when Hugo Pittman died, he left it to the state gallery. <laughs> and second, I've already touched on, on, on second, as, and we, we saw that very early 1880s <coughs> painting of, of, him, uh, of his uh, shop in Dieppe. Uh, he had Two great loves outside uh, London, outside Camden Town. One was Dieppe and the other was Venice. And in the early part of the last century, this is a 1902 painting, in the permanent collection given by Will and Mary Richardson. One of, uh, five, I think, five seconds upstairs that they have given, so you're <coughs> very well, in, well endowed. Um, Sickert had a deep reverence for the 19th century narrative painters and draftsmen of, of, of the earlier generation in, in Britain. Um, and he invented his own way of painting narrative paintings. They're narrative paintings that have no story. Uh, they're not exactly puzzle pictures, but you know that there is something more going on in the painting than just the straightforward picture of, in this case, uh, uh, ostensibly a Phoenician prostitute uh, sit sitting in her room. Uh, sometimes you'll find these are single figure paintings, sometimes they're double figure paintings, but and then sometimes they, they have um, narrative, narrative stories, uh, oh sorry, na narrative titles. Uh, Sickert was an exceedingly complicated man, not as belligerent as his master Whistler, but um, 
but a man of decided opinions and considerable complication in his life. I mean, he did have three wives uh, in, in, in total, uh, but when he was considering his second wife, he turned up at the registry office with two alternatives. Uh, <laughs> and was sent away by the registrar to go and sort it out. <laughs> This is one of his most beautiful um, Camp Camden Town stories. <coughs> Camden Town is a seedy area, well not a seedy now as it was, but it was a, a very seedy area of North London, uh, fairly close to where I live actually. Um, I pay my rates in the, to the borough of Camden. Um, but it, it was, uh, it had some rather nice, uh, some good buildings. Um, it had been the very northern point of the Nash developments, John Nash, the great um, Regency architect uh, who designed Regent Street and the whole of that area of London, the very northern point was actually in Camden Town, but that was, was finished in the 1830s or so. By the 1860s, the railways from the north of England had smashed through the elegant um, Georgian buildings, and so what had been uh, not the house for the wealthy, but uh, respectable, nice Georgian houses suddenly became the DOS houses for the Irish immigrants who were building, um, the navvies who were building the railways. Um, so it became an area of um, sordid lodging houses, uh, etc. And Sickert nearly always had two or three separate studios in different buildings, including in fact one that had been occupied by Whistler and another that had reputedly been occupied by Jack the Ripper. Uh, and you can see, I mean, this it's again one of these stories without, without a story. Uh, you can make up your own narrative to go with it. And it's a painting that he did several versions of um, uh, and with, di with different titles. It's sometimes called What Shall We Do for the Rent? Uh, and other, take, other versions of it are, have titles like Jack Ashore, um, The Sailor Come Home. And so you can make up your own narrative. But what they are about is not the actual story. They are about the physical matière, the actual tactility of painting. And Sickert was one of the great, great British uh, sort of studio impressionists, but whose principle was not what the painting was about, but it was about the actual tactility of, of the paint he was using. This is again another of these um, puzzle pictures which he did several versions, several versions in oil, and he also made uh, uh, etchings of the same subject. And the title is Ornui, Boredom. <laughs> Having been a founder member of the New English Art Club in the 18, 1884, he founded another little group of artists. The New York English Art Club it was a big group, I mean, it has uh, 80, 90 you know, members. Uh, but he founded a little group of intimate painters uh, around him in Camden Town. It came to be called the Camden Town Group. And uh, this is, is a painting by one of the, his close friends and members of the Camden Town Group. It's by Charles Trinner uh, of the Café Royal in London, um, painted in, in 1911. And the next picture I'm going to show you is this marginal diversion. It's by Adrian Allenson, who will see several paintings by upstairs, but it's actually the Café Royal, painted three years later. The Café Royal was a great meeting place. I mean, it still ostensibly is there in, in Regent Street, but it's now a very posh and very expensive restaurant. But it was there that the, a lot of the artists and were slightly what you might call the respectable but raffish society of London loved to meet. But it was also there in those days of what one might say much easier travel than today, where artists would often go and have dinner. They'd go down to Victoria Station after dinner, take the night train down to New Haven and the boat across to Dieppe, and in the morning they'd be having their croissants and coffee in Dieppe. It's much more difficult to do that today than it was a hundred years ago. 
that I actually had the great pleasure, my late wife and I had the great pleasure some years ago, of taking Mary Richardson and Will to Dieppe to show them where their signets and other paintings had been painted. This again is back to Charles Drinner. Uh, it's a street actually up in Hampstead. I walk along the street uh, several times a week as I live a few hundred yards further, further down and on, on the right. Um, uh, it's again another of those very intimate paintings by Charles Drinner of, of the, of the Camden Town Group. Their paintings were not exactly of sordid subjects, but they were mundane subjects. The everyday corners, corners of living rooms, uh, the cafes, uh, the street where people are just going about their, their normal business. And there's, uh, Trina had a studio uh, on building it, but immediately looks down uh, this little uh, street. And there's another uh, painting of the same view in the Tate Gallery, which was actually painted <coughs> on the day of uh, King George V's Jubilee, and it's all hung with, with bunting. And again, um, Harold Gilman, another, another of the, um, the Camden Town artists, but again, just an ordinary, plain landlady in their, in their local lodgings, Not, nothing fancy, absolutely the diametric opposite of the, uh, the Regal and Chiffon School of Sargent. The third, uh, after Alfons Le Gros retired from the slave, um, a man who was not very well known as a uh, became the slave professor, a man called Fred Brown. Um, but he assembled a remarkable staff, uh, including Henry Thomas, who painted this painting, and Wilson Steer, who we saw the girls running on Walter's Week here uh, earlier in, in, in the talk. Um, and Henry Tonks became probably the most influential teacher uh, from the 1890s, certainly through into the early, early 20s in Britain. And this is one of his most elegant uh, paintings of a milliner's mill 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 shop. Uh, you'll see him later in the talk in another guise, because Tonks had two careers. Before becoming a professional artist and teacher, he had actually trained and practiced as a surgeon. And in the, in, the, in the First War, he was, he was employed uh, to draw the faces of seriously injured soldiers in order to help, uh, the, reconstruct, to help the surgeons with the reconstruction of, of their faces. And you'll see some later a horrific image by him. But here he is doing a very elegant uh, Beaumont painting. The slight, again, diversion, except in date. Uh, there was a group of tempera painters in Birmingham, um, in Birmingham particularly. Uh, and this by a man called Joseph Southall, um, a great Quaker, um, and it's called the Agate. It, it has just, it's been on loan to the National Portrait Gallery in London for some years, but happily they've just been able to purchase it. And it's, it's a self-portrait of himself and his wife. Um, as you see, even on the beach, they are very correctly dressed as, as Quakers. But Mrs. Southall is holding in her hand an agate, which you find on the beach of Southall. And if you paint in tempera, you think the color is bound, the powder colors are bound together with egg yolk. Um, so you get a surplus of egg whites, and not all tempera painters want to spend their life eating meringues. Um, but egg, egg whites are very good uh, for to be used in gilding, and so Mrs. Southall uh, did the gilding of her, uh, well, the gilded his frames, and you polish, of course, the gilding with an agate, and so there is a, a symbolism in this. It's one of the agates that they found on the shore at Southwold, um, and but it's also something that we can use for her own work as a, a, a framer. And another of the, that little group of Birmingham temple painters, Arthur Joseph Gaskin, um, who again, a uh, painter, uh, wood engraver, illustrator, and uh, a craftsman. His wife, and, uh, 
again, was an equally a craftsman, uh, Georgie Gaskin, uh, who was the most beautiful uh, jeweller. And so there was this whole group of, of craftsmen working, particularly in Birmingham. Um, they were known as the Birmingham Group, uh, and I'll show you an interesting one later uh, in a slightly different context. Uh, but they were very much reviving uh, the Quattrocento uh, te tempera technique. This, although it's a later image, it's a late 1920s image, uh, again by Sickert, it's an etching of Roger Fry giving a lecture. Roger Fry was one of the Bloomsbury group, um, majorly influential uh, teacher, sometime advisor to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and to uh, Pierpont Morgan himself. Uh, and I hope none of you do this, uh, but Fry in the, in the lecture which he's giving here which has this rather nice title of Vision, Volumes of Recession, was going on about Cezanne and significant form. And Sickert was sitting somewhere down there in the front row, uh, muttering away about the virtues of um, the Pre-Raphaelites and Dega, etc. And eventually, Fry broke off his lecture and walked to the front of the stage and said, Shut up, Walter! Shut up! <laughs> so, <laughs> but in 1911, Fry organized, uh, which is prob probably the most controversial and important uh, exhibition of art exhibition in London that was <coughs> held, uh, probably ever held. Um, it was Manet and the Post Impressionists at the Grafton Gallery uh, in uh, November, through, uh, November 1910 through to January 1915. And in fact, it, it prompted Virginia Woolf, some years later, in, her, in one of her essays, uh, to say, to write the, an essay called Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, which Virginia Woolf wrote in 1924. She said, on or about December 1910, human character changed. I'm not saying that one went out, as one might, into a garden, and there saw that a rose had flowered, or that a hen had laid an egg. The change was not sudden and definite like that, but a change there was, nevertheless, a change there was nevertheless. And since one must be arbitrary, let us date it about the year 1910. Well, she was obviously referring directly to this exhibition organized by Roger Fry, uh, which caused the younger painters to jump up in joy as they were looking at, at, at Gauguin's Manny Cezanne uh, and, and all the post impressionists. It's very exciting, <laughs> stimulating. And uh, for an older generation, it caused apoplexy. Uh, now, there was the odd psych psychiatrist who wrote an essay to prove that all post-impressionists were lunatics. Um, and it became the great, great controversial ex exhibition of the period. And very much at the same date, I mean, this is a group of the young students. Henry Tonks actually forbade his students at the Slade to go and see the exhibition, which of course had the, exactly the opposite effect. Uh, this is a painting by the man on the left, uh, who was a, a young student. They, they were all Slade students about it from the, the girl. Uh, the painting is called Some Later, Some Later Primitives and Madame Tisserand. Dealing with Madame Tisserand first, she ran their favorite restaurant where they used to go and eat. It was obviously rather beautiful, so she was an added attraction as well as the cheap food. John Curry actually um, is, is virtually unknown. Um, he found his beloved mistress, Dolly Henry, was being unfaithful, and he shot her and then shot himself. Uh, so that was the end of his career. <laughs> but we have here in this painting Curry on the, on the left hand side looking at. Mark Gertler, reading through. Um, uh, C.R.W. Levinson, and you will see a very fine sort of portrait of him in the exhibition upstairs. Edward Wadsworth, and there's a very nice early woodcut by him in the little print room. And Adrian Allenson, who features again extensively in the upstairs exhibition. Henry Tongs, many years later, this, this painting is done about 1912, uh, 20 years later, 
Henry Tonks looking back on his years at the Slade, said that at that period there seemed to have been an outbreak of talent. Uh, and he was certainly right. I mean, this was an amazing group of young artists. Uh, this is an Adrian Allenson, you'll see, see upstairs, painted at exactly the same time. <coughs> One of the other, now most famous lauded of the artists of that generation, was Stanley Spencer. This is a very early um, self-portrait uh, of him from, from the same stage. Uh, Spencer went on to become, uh, <coughs> to me, I think probably, I would, well, I would certainly put him in, in, the, in the bracket, but tops of three or four painters of 20th century Britain. Um, he was an extraordinary, well-read, but also naive uh, character. Um, he was born in, in a small, beautiful village, idyllic village on the Thames called Cookham. And he actually, the whole of the Bible took place in Cookham. Uh, this is Elizabeth and Zacharias. Uh, in the churchyard at, at, at Cookham. Christ preached at Cookham Regatta. Christ walked down the street in the village at Cookham. Um, he wasn't naive, uh, but he had obviously great admiration, uh, particularly for Piero La Francesca, who was the artist most admired when he was at the student. Um, uh, but he had this absolute innocence. Um, the resurrection happens in uh, Cookham churchyard. And another of the painters, who you'll see in several guises as I go on, uh, Paul Nash was equally a student at the Slade for a short time at this period. Um, his very early work, as, as in this, it's a, a watercolour in, in, well, in grey, grey, grey washes, which I had the privilege of once buying and selling to the Tate Gallery in London, where it now is, um, very much influenced by uh, pre Raphaelites and, and, and poetry. But he became one of the outstanding uh, artists of the First War, as, as you will see. But apart from Roger Fry's post impressionist exhibition, the other uh, greatest things that happened uh, in London to infuriate the uh, bourgeoisie was, first of all, um, the appearance of Marinetti, the Italian futurist painter, um, who gave a conference, he nearly died actually, he was dressed in a diving suit and the Air condition, air pump went wrong. Um, but they, influenced by Marinetti, Wyndham Lewis uh, published this magazine called Blast, which was an attack on almost everything uh, that the more conservative uh, part of the London society or British society uh, believed in. Um, but not only was it an attack <coughs> on their values, it lauded the machine above mankind because the machine was efficient. People were inefficient, uh, and it was very much an early blast of proto fascism. Um, I mean, the, the Italian future certainly became very strong supporters of, of, of Mussolini. Um, and of course, uh, you'll see upstairs uh, by him, there's a very beautiful portrait drawing by him of Ezra Pound, again, I mean, one of America's great fascist pre preachers and writers. So very, very strong uh, right-wing painter, attacking everything. <laughs> but immediately after that, and one of course was of the great subscribers, and again a friend of Marinetti's, was C.R.W. Nevinson, uh, who was in that uh, portrait by, group portrait by John Curry of the neo-primitives. The neo um, as you can see from this 1913 painting by Nevinson, he was very much very, very strongly influenced by the Italian futurists. But he became an ambulance orderly with the outbreak of war. Uh, for a year or two, his right-wing aesthetic, his praise of the machine, the machine caused by 1916-17, including tanks, etc. Um, he saw the disastrous result of the ascetic that he had been preaching. And although in this one of his greatest of the war paintings, Les Mitrailleurs, he marries his futurist uh, imagery, or his, this futurist belief, with the image where the man and the machine are virtually, uh, virtually one. I mean, the man behind the machine gun is, is virtually a robotic figure. 
But after a year or two as an ambulance orderly, um, his work became, I mean, it, the reality of life, or the reality of the bloody life he was seeing, witnessing, uh, undermined his aesthetic. Uh, particularly, he never really quite recovered it. But the futurist still um, played an, an enormous part in the, uh, the art of, of the First War. I mean, this is Wyndham Lewis on one of the great pictures that he did immediately post-war for the Imperial War Museum. Um, and, I mean, this is he, who, the man who did the, the cover of Blast. And, of course, you'll see his portrait of, uh, of Wyndham Lewis upstairs um, and two other paintings, including a 1936 one, um, which is obviously uh, playing with the imagery of the Spanish Civil War, in which, of course, he would be a strong supporter of General Franco. And another of the young futurist painters, the people who sent to the war, William Roberts. And so the that robotic futurist imagery played quite an important part uh, in uh, British art of, of, of the First War. But the most amazing painter to come out of this is Paul Nash, who did that grey wash drawing I showed you just now, uh, which was inspired by the poetry of George Borrow. But he was out there, first of all, as a combat, later as an official war artist, uh, but was really looking at the devastation <coughs> of landscape, I mean, the trees shattered by the continuous shelling, uh, blood red of the, of the sky and the landscape, and prophetically, somewhat cynically, he entitled this picture, we are making a new world. Nash mm -hmm. is, is one of those artists who actually was an official war artist in both World War I and the Garden in World War II, and we will refer to him again later. So William Orpen, who, we also, who did that early portrait you saw of Augustus John, um, beginning of my talk, uh, also became an official war artist. Uh, Orpen was a, a genius in many ways, but almost too clever. He, he loved painting with mirrors and reflections and things, and this is his own self-portrait in front of a mirror with the view of, I mean, painted at the front, you can see the battle, I mean, battle uh, torn buildings of France uh, through the window to the side. But equally, the way he plays with the whiskey bottles and the soda siphons. Um, he was a rather ugly little man uh, with a very deformed, well, low, heavy lower lip. And I think to prove to the world that he wasn't ugly, he painted more self portraits than anybody <laughs> else ever. And they did more, uh, more women, I think, than almost any other artist of his generation. And there is a story, probably apocryphal of a lady asking him once whether he would paint her in the nude. He said, yes, but do you mind if I keep my socks on because I like so much put my brushes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is by John Nash, the younger brother of Paul, who painted that blood-red landscape we're painting a new world. Um, it's interesting, both Stan Spencer and Paul Nash were two of the Toweringly great figures of the period, both had younger brothers who were themselves exceedingly good painters, but were totally overshadowed by their elder brothers. Luckily, John, who I did meet once, um, he said his priorities in life were fishing, gardening, and painting in that order. Um, and of course, John Singer Sargent, who we saw with that, his regular chief on portrait of Lady Agnew earlier in the talk, but here doing one of the poignantly great uh, memorials to, to the First War, Gast. Uh, there's a drawing, two drawings for it in, in, the, in the little print room display upstairs. Um, Sergeant divided his, his, his life between, uh, well, London and, and Boston, of course, because he painted the murals, great murals in the public library in Boston. Uh, he was a Bostonian, born in Italy, so he was one of those very uh, suave uh, characters like, like Henry James, his great, his great friend. But this is one of the most dramatically poignant paintings, and it is 
considerably larger than the image on the, on the screen. Bloomsbury I've touched on already with, with Roger Fry, and of course um, one of the other great figures of Bloomsbury uh, is Lyndon Strachey, the subject of, 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 of this portrait. Um, the man who, I suppose, reformed biography, really, probably in the English-speaking world, um, having turned away from the great three-volume biographies of the great Victorians, he wrote um, uh, not totally uh, laudatory portraits of some of the, uh, particularly in a book called Eminent Victorians, um, uh, described uh, um, Florence Nightingale as this, this, uh, mistaking the, the Lord for a sanitary engineer, I think was uh, his description of her. Uh, but he, he was a poet and writer. It was painted by Henry Lamb, uh, again another of that generation of, of Slade students. But Little Strangely was very much a part of the Bloomsbury Center. And I touched, or showed you quite a lot of Nevinson. He did those, that great painting of the mitrailleurs and the Futurist uh, arrival at, at Southampton. He never regained the, the strength of that aesthetic, but he did have a brief flowering again in immediately post war New York when he painted a whole series of images of, of the skyline and the um, uh, old elevated railways, etc., of, of New York. But after that, he settled down to be a fairly mundane painter of ordinary landscapes and still lives. But back to Stan Spencer. He got, and it's, it's one of the most extraordinary things, is this amazing commission po post-war to paint a memorial, the interior of a memorial chapel. And it's really the nearest thing that Britain uh, has to, to the uh, Grotto uh, in, in, in Venice. Um, it was a memorial. The building was specially built um, by an architect called Philip Tilden. Um, and Stan Spencer was commissioned to do all the decoration of it. And he before he became an official war artist, had actually been a, a, a hospital orderly. And all the scenes of this are scenes uh, in the hospital of people doing mundane things, of changing bedpans, scrubbing floors, doing the laundry, etc. Except for the great altarpiece, um, the East End, which is the dead soldiers getting out of their graves and presenting their rifles to the quartermaster, i.e. Christ. And it's one of the most extraordinary, I mean, it's, it's a complete, I mean, it's a room the, the size of this, every part of the wall covered. It's one of the, if any of you are in England at any time, I would, it's not very far from London, uh, it's a village called Berkeley, um, near Cooken, where Spencer was born, and it's one of the most beautiful and moving uh, bits of artwork uh, in, in Britain, I think. I showed you John Nash, the younger brother of, of Paul. This is Gilbert Spencer, the younger brother of, of, of Stan. Again, um, an extraordinary good painter. Uh, this is a 1920s landscape. Um, in fact, I knew Gilbert quite well in his later life. And although he was obviously overshadowed very much by Stanley, he was saying, but I was more of a man than Stanley. <laughs> And this, this again is John Nash when he came back. I mean, he did that lovely painting of the figures going over the top in, in the snow. But he became very much a pastoral painter of, of, the English, of the English countryside. But his brother Paul went on uh, to become one of the most important uh, links between British art and the continental surrealist painters uh, in the 1930s. And this is one of his strange surreal uh, well, landscapes with strange surreal objects in it. But on the right, you see this, this extraordinary mound. Paul Nash always had a profound feeling for the <coughs> genus Loki, uh, the spirit of, of, of the place. And he loved ancient landscapes, landscapes with ancient groves, with old tumuli, burial mounds, etc. And he seemed to respond to the vibes of, of the landscape. But also he had this very curious thing, and I think it may have 
risen out of his experiences in the First War, of doing landscapes with barriers that stop your eye going into the landscape. You've got to get round the, these objects. I used, having been a picture dealer all, all, all my life, I, I, mean, I always tell people I wouldn't go to a, a teetotal wine merchant, I, and, I, and I wouldn't go to a picture dealer who doesn't buy pictures for himself or herself. Uh, and I used to own a lovely 1917 um, Paul Nash uh, watercolour with ink drawing, again now in the, in the Tate Gallery's collection. Um, but it was of an orchard uh, down towards the end of the First War, uh, a very beautifully uh, laid out orchard, all the trees and receding lines. But right across the front was a, a wire fence which stopped you going into it, except for the birds. The birds were free to fly over. And always it said very often, these barriers that stop you getting, in, stop your eye getting directly into the picture. You have to work your way around it. And another picture you'll see upstairs, the, the, the uh, first wall, painted first wall time, Duncan Grant of David Garnett, um, uh, writer, minor poet. <coughs> both Duncan and um, David Garnett were both pacifists um, and working, working on the land. And, that was why Vanessa Bell bought Charleston Farmhouse, which is um, one of the main centers for a study of, uh, of the Bloomsbury artists and writers, um, because it gave, there was land there, and she could employ people like David Garnett and Duncan Grant to work on the land. And this is Vanessa Bell, uh, sorry, this is by Vanessa Bell of Virginia Woolf. So um, Vanessa, Vanessa Bell her husband had Charleston Farmhouse, but Virginia Woolf and her husband um, had a house nearby called Monk's House. Uh, and both of them are open to the public and the National Trust houses now. And the painting which I put in here for a particular reason is by one of those Birmingham craftsmen a man called Maxwell Armfield, um, who was born in 1881. And when the Fun Arts Center, where I worked in 1907, had an exhibition to Birmingham Craftsman, um, he was already in that, he, but he was one, one of the youngest members of that group. Uh, like Joseph Southall, he was a Quaker, and when life was made uncomfortable for him in the First War, he actually moved to California. And this is called uh, the Pacific Portrait, or has also been called the Madonna of the Pacific. Uh, it's a beautiful tempera painting done by him at La Jolla um, in uh, 1920. And if any of you are great benefactors for this museum, it's been in an East Coast collection since I assisted there uh, 45 years ago, but it's about to come on the market again, and it should find a home in California, because I think it is the, probably the most beautiful Quattrocento portrait that was ever painted in this state. <laughs> and it fits with, again, this, this uh, type of painting. I mean, looking back to early Italian painting, although it's a workman and it's called weariness, it's very much in the tradition of the great Italian Pietas. And the painting by William Strang, uh, who had been the best student of Alphonse Le Gros at, at the Tate and carried on Le Gros' tradition as a craftsman and etcher, beautiful etcher. Uh, the craftsman C.R. Ashley once wrote of, of Strang that something of the ugliness of all his sitters shows through the beauty of his craftsmanship. <laughs> um, certainly, I mean, this lady is, is, is rather soulful rather than ugly, but she is actually wearing a hat made in the Omega workshops, the workshops that Roger Fry set up to employ uh, craftsmen and artists making things from, from clothes to hats to furniture, etc. And Henry Tonks, the man who did that beautiful milliner shop here in the First War, drawing these horrendous wounds so the surgeons could have something to work on in order to rebuild the faces. And this whole group of, 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 of 
they made me a pastel. Um, they are in the Wilkin Institute, which is a medical institute in London, because they are actually were actually done for medical purposes, not for artistic purposes. And the Wilkin Foundation is still rather cherry about showing them because for generations, and after all, we're all of a generation uh, or generations, uh, were brought up on Francis Bacon. These drawings are actually horrifyingly rather beautiful. Um, but the Wilkin Foundation doesn't want people looking at them for their beauty. They want them to look at them for uh, medical reasons. I said earlier that there were two teaching institutions that were majorly influential in the period I've been talking about. Um, the Slade, which had been going since the 1860s. Um, then something which had started life as the School of Design way back in the, in, 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 in the mid uh, early 19th century uh, was turned in 1918 into the Royal College of Art, which it still is. And the man who became principal of the Royal College of Art in 1918 was William Rosenstein, seen here um, in, a, in one of his self portraits. Um, William Rosenstein had trained at the Slade up around Fonce Le Gros. Uh, he had then gone to Paris and worked there. Um, he was one of the important links, uh, artistic links, between Britain and late, late 19th century Paris. And I think was one of the most brilliant teachers that uh, Britain had ever, ever had. Uh, his son, John Rosenstein, went on to become head of the Tate Gallery uh, many years later. Uh, but something strange had happened to Rosenstein. In his early work, he was very in intuitive. Um, he could, in, in his drawings, he could make as much play with blank paper as he could with the bits that he drew on. But he went to India in, I think it was 1911, and he suddenly became terribly serious. And almost his paintings become much more pedantic. Uh, I'm going to show you one of his earlier paintings. He also painted, he came from, um, uh, from Lancashire. Uh, he was born, no, from Yorkshire, I think as well. Um, his, fa his father's family were German merchants in the woolen trade, and <coughs> Bradford in Yorkshire was the centre of the woolen trade in the, of the world. Uh, even in my day as a, days as a dealer, we had one clown who came from South Australia to do his ba basic training in the wool trade in, in Bradford. Rosenstein's family had come over as German merchants, so he was, he was uh, and also obviously of Jewish extraction. <coughs> and when he first came to London, he did a series of paintings in uh, the synagogue in Brick Lane in the east end of London. Again, a building that tells one a lot about the illustration, uh, the um, civilization of London. The building was originally a Huguenot church. It then became a synagogue, and now it is a mosque. <laughs> but Rosenstein. In a very quick time, I mean, having become principal of the reformed Royal College of Art in 1918, by the mid-20s, mid uh, was producing a whole generation of the most important artists of, uh, of the 20th century. Amongst them, the young Henry Moore, the young Barbara Hepworth, and of course, both Moore and Hepworth looking back in the early carvings at a slightly older man, yet another of those American emigres to England, Jacob Epstein. And you'll see upstairs there's a, there's a portrait head by Epstein of Dolores. Epstein had a, almost a, a split personality, um, depending whether he was wearing his modeling uh, smock or his carving smock. Uh, when he was carving stone, he was a very modernistic sculptor, and certainly one of the great inspirations for both young Moore and the, and the young uh, Barbara Hepworth. But when he had his modeling smock on, he was much more, although still aggressively modern, but a much more conventional uh, artist. Uh, the First War, of course, threw up a whole generation <coughs> of sculptors who were, had to cope with the commissions for war memorials. And this is a moment to touch on 
yet another teaching institution that had grown up, um, which was the British School at Rome. There was a World's Fair in Rome in 1911, and Sir Edwin Luntian was a great uh, architect who designed the British Pavilion. Mm -hmm. And the Italians liked it so much that they offered the site to Britain if we would found a school to rival the American Academy. And so Luckett has pulled out everything beside it, behind the facade and built the British School as it is today. Um, and the school had basically four scholarships. There were three years. The scholarship lasted for three years at that stage. There was a scholarship for sculpture, a scholarship for architecture, a scholarship for painting, for decorative painting, sorry, not just painting, for decorative painting, and a scholarship for printmaking. Uh, the first sculptor to win the uh, Prix de Rome was Gilbert Ledwood, who did the five figures here on the, the girls' memorial. And this again, this interestingly, and of course it happens with, with, with all the great memorials, uh, it is a combination of uh, both sculptor and architect. And Gilbert Ledwood was the first um, sculptor to win the Prix de Rome. And Charles Bradshaw, who designed the um, uh, truncated pyramid, uh, was the first sculptor, uh, first architect to, to win the Prix de Rome. Uh, they took the, the school was set up <coughs> in 1911, but of course the building wasn't ready to receive students until 1913. So Gilbert Ledger had been there just for a year uh, before the war broke out, and of course uh, the scholarships were suspended for the duration of the war. And it is, I don't know, I mean, it's the God's Parade, a uh, God's Memorial in, in, in London, just <coughs> just opposite Horse God's Parade. <coughs> in fact, there's a story, I, I did a Gilbert Ledwood centenary exhibition some years ago. And in his manuscript autobiography, although these five figures look superficially, uh, so they're identical, they are, each, each one is a figure modeled on a soldier from one of the five guards' brigades. And in his autobiography, he describes marching, uh, going on parade at uh, Wellington Barracks in Chelsea and selecting three potential models um, for the figure for the Irish guards. Uh, the three figures, three men, were then marched by a sergeant from the parade ground to Ledwood Studio in Chelsea. And when he got them there, the Irish sergeant said to Ledwood, he said, what shall I tell them to be doing now, sir? Ledwood said, well, tell them to strip off, of course. And, be going, and do you say that to the women when they come to model here? <laughs> And the other tru truly great uh, memorial in central London is the Artillery Memorial. Again, Charles Sergeant Drago, who did the figures on it, was the second sculptor to win the Prix de Rome, uh, but actually never took it out because he won it in 1914, and, and it wasn't there. And by the end of the war, um, he not only won a military cross, uh, been wounded three times, uh, was married, and he didn't want to become a student again. Uh, not unreasonably, and uh, he, I've actually seen the, the document in the British School of Rome, and he applied to the ex, ex, allowed to carry out his scholarship in London rather than go to Rome, and it's very neatly annotated, agreed, provided it does not create a precedent. <laughs> And I don't know if any of you have been in London this summer, but one of the revelatory exhibitions to many, many, many people was the summer exhibition at the Dulwich Art Gallery of Winifred Knights, who was the first woman to win the Prix de Rome. Again, a student, uh, a favorite, <coughs> a favorite student of Professor Tonks uh, at, at the Slade. And this is, is the Eve of the Deluge. Again, an extraordinary, daring, and modern picture. <coughs> And again, with, with overlaps, um, this is by Ben Nicholson, um, who became one of the great uh, protagonists of non-figurative 
uh, painting uh, in England in the 1930s. Um, he was the son of one of the great Edwardian painters, uh, William Nicholson, Sir William Nicholson, who could uh, manipulate whites and silvers more beautifully, I think, than any other painter of his generation. Although his daughter-in-law um, told me once that she'd had great arguments with her, we'll see one of her paintings in a minute, uh, great arguments with her father-in-law, because he seldom painted in anything lighter than yellow ochre, and she seldom painted in anything darker. <laughs> but William Nicholson had started his uh, career also as a print and poster maker, and along with his brother-in-law, uh, James Pride. And this is a great uh, collage uh, poster for, for the Lyceum Theatre. Um, again, done with tornite paper and, and collage. So he'd been a very avant-garde designer in the 1880s, 1890s, but became one of the most beautiful painters of, well, of the first uh, three decades of the 20th century in England. And this is by Winifred Nicholson, his daughter-in-law. And in fact, I think it was she rather than her husband, Ben Nicholson, who was the most avant-garde. Um, and in fact, she who owned <coughs> um, one of the great Mondrians, uh, which was the first Mondrian to be in a private collection in England. <coughs> she, her husband, I mean, they, they, she and her husband parted by the late 20s, but uh, during the 1920s they were working very closely together, and also working very closely uh, with Christopher Wood. And in the exhibition upstairs, I mean, in your own permanent collection here, you have a very fine painting of Pierre Harbour by Christopher Wood, uh, but they were both pushing towards modernism, and Christopher Wood here, is, uh, with the Villa Savoie, uh, is certainly making one of the earliest English experiments in, in surrealism. Unfortunately, um, he was a rather mixed up character and also got in with a, a fast set and was taking a much, much cocaine. Uh, he actually jumped under a railway train on Salisbury Station at the age of 30, so his, his output was somewhat limited, but this is his, one of his most famous images, which is in the Tate Gallery. But having worked closely with Winifred Nicholson and with Ben, Ben went on to become the great pioneer, uh, follower of Mondrian in, in England, um, particularly with these white forms. And when Ben split up from his wife Winifred, uh, he got together with Barbara Hepburn. And there was great rivalry, of course, and there's still often debate about whether it was Barbara Hepworth or Henry Moore who made the first daring move to put a hole through a human figure. And this leads us on to a bit more sculpture, because the sculptures are very important. And a lot of the best sculpture in England at that time was not only being done by Moore and Hepworth, but it was being done by basically more conservative figures who were doing public sculpture. This is by Eric Gill. Um, it's on the uh, BBC building. Um, and it was, it prompted, I think, what must be one of the most beautiful, bizarre letters of introduction that anybody can have ever written or received for that matter. But when Gill was commissioned to do this, he wrote to a young actor called Leslie French. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I bought some drawings from Leslie French some years ago when I did a big exhibition of sculpture in Britain between the walls, and Leslie French showed me this letter. It said, Dear Sir, you may have heard that I, Leslie French was a young act, he was acting Ariel at the Old Vic Theatre at the time. He said, Dear Sir, you may have heard that I was to do sculptures for Ariel on the new BBC building. I'm writing to ask you if you care to let me make some drawings from your beautiful figure as a help to me in making the sculpture. Don't hesitate to say no if you'd rather not, but I should be very grateful if you would agree. Beautiful men are not common. Yours sincerely, Eric Gill. <laughs> as a letter of introduction, that has to <laughs> take the biscuit. But the last letter of the series was almost as funny and slightly uh, more, more inexplicable. It's, it was actually from Eric Gill's wife uh, to, to Leslie French. It said, Dear Eric, uh, dear, dear Leslie, uh, Eric wants you to go down to the exhibition and choose a show. It was such fun seeing you skipping around in the park this summer. 
I presume that's the French being acting at the Open Air Theatre in Regent's Park. It's such fun to see you skipping around in the park this summer. Um, Eric, Eric says he would like you to go down to the exhibition and choose a drawing of yourself. He hopes you don't mind being upside down, but he preferred you that way. <laughs> And we're getting very near the end here. This is by Eric Rafilius. It's a painting of his friend Edward Borden. Um, Borden and Rafilius were two of the brightest students, along with Henry Moore in the Sculpture School and Barbara Hillcrest in the Sculpture School, at the Royal College of Art in, in the 1920s. And at this stage, they had just painted a uh, major mural for a building called Bonnie College in South London. Uh, Rosenstein was always battling on behalf of his students and uh, chose to be the great uh, artistic entrepreneur, supplier of many of the paintings of the Huntington and, uh, and other, other museums in this country. Uh, Duveen had just paid the expenses for Rex Whistler to do the decoration in the refreshment room at the Tate Gallery. And Rosenstein went to him and said, you just paid for a Slade student to do a mural. Would you care to fund some Royal College of students to do a mural? And Duveen agreed. And Revillius and Borden painted uh, a great mural in Morley College. Extraordinary, I mean, they were still 26 years old when it was unveiled. It was unveiled by Stanley Baldwin, who had already been Prime Minister and was to be Prime Minister again a few years later. Queen Mary went to see it a few weeks after it was unveiled. Um, and these two 26 year olds had their careers made in a way. And in fact, the pipe like things on the left were actually cartoons, rolled up cartoons from Mural and Morley College. And sadly, I mean, having been unveiled in 1929, was bombed in 1940, and so it's only known from photographs. Another, this, this is Eric, Eric, Eric Revelius. Um, I mean, he became one of the great, interesting landscape painters of uh, the 1930s. But it's very interesting, again, this quality that one has in the Nashes. Most artists would actually very carefully avoid the barbed wire and things in front of this. And yet Revelius, I mean, he loved these intrusions of, of man into the landscape. I mean, he's painting one of the oldest chalk figures in that, but to have uh, the barbed wire and, and the, uh, the clutter of modern civilization in the front, and the way it ties the composition together for him. He became again one, one of the most important of our Second World War artists, uh, but sadly was, was killed um, in 1942. And Edward Borden, who is a figure in uh, sitting painting in the Rapidius portrait I just showed you, uh, this, this is him. Uh, as, as a watercolorist um, in, in Essex in, in the 1930s. Uh, interestingly, I mean, I've written a number of uh, books. I mentioned Bolden in her very kind introduction of me, and in fact, uh, in a review in Country Life, and the most recent one, which I write then with a graphic designer friend called Brown Webb, uh, it was reviewed in Country Life a few weeks ago, and uh, the reviewer said, uh, compared Bolden's early style as a cross between a naive painter and a distant follower of Cezanne, which I think you can see in this. John Piper, again, uh, another um, abstract artist in the 1930s, went back to figuration at, at, the, at the end of the 30s, um, uh, particularly for a whole group of drawings that he did for recording Britain, the buildings that might get destroyed. Um, and after that, and again, this is a drawing you'll see up. Sorry, is this one you'll see up? No, this isn't yours, is it? No. Uh, it's, it's similar to the ones upstairs. Henry Moore, both, apart from being a sculptor, was commissioned, amongst other things, in, in the war to go down and do drawings in the underground shelters in London. Uh, the underground shelters had been underground stations were used as shelters at night uh, to protect people from the bombing. Um, at the very end, we go back to Paul Nash. Nash, as I said, had been a war painter in both <coughs> the First and Second War. And this is one of his most dramatic paintings 
of the Second War is called Tut Tutus Mir, the Dead Sea. <coughs> and it's an extraordinary graveyard of old crashed aeroplanes. But to make the talk come full circle, I'm not quite bad for the falling rocket, but this is Paul Nash's great painting of the Battle of Britain, which again, I mean, is momentarily you look at it, it's actually pretty beautiful with these great swells of, of light and smoke, but then you realize there's aeroplanes crashing into the water, etc. And so from the falling rocket to the Battle of Britain, 65 years on. Thank you very much.